your screen. All right, there you go. All right. Hello, everyone. Very good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you're joining. And um, thank you for taking time to join our uh, session for today uh, with the IPATH uh, South California chapter. I know this event is co-hosted by uh, various other EIPath chapters uh, around America's time zone. So you may be um, in anywhere. You may be anywhere uh, in US and joining here. So. Um, myself, Pradeep Shukla, and I have uh, my colleague and host with me, uh, Russell, and we'll get through this. Uh, this is a continuation of our Automation Ops series. Um, so let's do an introduction briefly, and then we'll continue from our uh, Automation Ops discussion that we started uh, in our previous session. And in case if you are joining this for the first time, I would, uh, and you're interested in uh, that you missed out the first session. There is a recording available on the UiPath Community YouTube channel. You can always go watch there, or you can also uh, find the same recording on a link uh, on the community page as well. Uh, you can always go there and uh, take it from there. All right, so this is about South California chapter. This is pretty standard for all of our UiPath chapters. Uh, which is kind of a uh, a group, an online community for of all the developers, professionals, enthusiasts. Uh, whether you are actually a UiPath developer who is actually actually actively developing it, or you are an architect or a, a program manager, a project manager who is managing RPA projects. So it's it's a it's a uh, a group where all uh, folks can come from different backgrounds and learn and uh, explore UiPath products in great detail. Uh, as I mentioned, I am Pradeep Shukla. I work for Parton as Chief Technologist. Uh, Diana is the Community Manager. Uh, she's not here today. Uh, and I have Russell with me. Uh, Russell, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I am Russell Fetchas, and, and Pradeep mentioned we are the chapter leads for so Southern California chapter for UiPath community. And this is being hosted across several states and chapters as well. So I, I am from uh, one of the uh, platinum partners of UiPath, which is Kubotica and leading the technical capability at Kubotica for our intelligent automation services. Very well, thank you, Russell. And we'll get to the topics for today. Um, so there are two topics that we are going to plan to cover today in automation ops. Uh, we covered a couple of topics last time, uh, pipelines and source control within automation ops. Uh, today we are planning to cover governance and uh, see and feeds management. Uh, so to get you in detail, I will hand it over to Russell. He will cover the automation ops governance section. And after that, I will take uh, you through the feeds management section and with a follow-up demonstration of the capability that we have. Over to you, Russell. Sure. Thanks, Philip. If you don't mind um, I'm sharing the screen first. Yeah, let me stop sharing. Go ahead. Great. Let me just share my screen right here. <clears throat> I hope you can see my screen right now. Great. So, automation ops. Um, as Pradeep mentioned, we have, for the first session, we have covered high level of what is automation ops, but I'll, I'll just briefly go through that real quick and deep dive on source control and pipeline management aspect or pipeline, CICD pipeline aspect of automation ops. So, <clears throat> overall, automation ops is, when you think about it, when you, uh, um, when you say automation ops, governance is the first thing that comes in mind, right? Because automation ops helps you with governing the different components that you are using as part of the UiPath platform, whether you are a developer using UiPath Studio, whether you are a uh, uh, just a user using UiPath Assistant or using Studio Web, 
um, as well as a developer and, and just uh, uh, UiPath robot. So automation ops serves as the governing um, platform that helps you enforce the policies in a strict manner, not just in an SOP, but within the platform itself, it helps you enforce what are the things that you can or cannot do with the automations that you build or the automations that you use. So that's how automation ops is. And again, we touch a bit of this aspect during the first session, but now what we will do is we will deep dive into the governance and also the feeds management and how the different components can leverage the automation ops um, offering as part of UiPath Cloud. So first, um, automation ops is compatible with 2020.10 the version and later uh, for studio. For robot, it's 2021.10 and assistant 2021.4 and up. And in order to use this, so the orchestrator must have the interactive sign-in enabled. So in a user's perspective, they should be licensed um, through sign-in method, not the, the machine key for named user licenses. So I'll, I'll cover more on that um, in a bit. So when, again, when you talk about automation ops, it's mainly governing the, the different components that you use within your path, whether it's studio, assistant, studio web, robot. So these are the deployment targets for the policies that you will be defining. For each of these components, you can control, let's say for UiPath Studio, you would be able to control the workflow analyzer rules, which we will deep dive uh, in a bit. Um, what, what feeds they can connect to, what, uh, what uh, configuration they can change within UiPath Studio, right? So th these are the things that um, can be centrally uh, managed by your, your compliance team or your, your your um, COE team, right? So that it won't be an individual setting per uh, per client, right? So that's for UiPath Studio, and for each of these um, for each of these uh, components, they have their own uh, sets of policies you can configure, um, and and I'll I'll show that in a bit during the demo, right? <clears throat> Automation Ops is flexible in easy to use, enabling you to quickly govern large deployments. I will show that. <clears throat> you just need to select the policy templates depending on the products and associated version installed in your organization. Um, for, uh, you can create policies for the products that you want to govern, and um, you'll show you'll see that in the demo. And if your org is already using a file-based governance, so previously it's file-based governance where you generate the policy config file and you have to upload them into your orchestrator um, or automation ops. Now you can also manage this policy config file within automation ops itself. Right? And once you have created the policy, you can deploy it at a tenant, group, or user level. I'll, I'll show that uh, as well during the demo. So what are the main benefits? Why should we even care, right? Again, automation, when it comes to automation, as you, especially as you scale, there are lots of risks that are, uh, that, that are surfacing. Uh, let's say, what are the, the can the bots go rogue, or uh, are we are we um, using the best practices when implementing our automation at scale? Are we using the correct password policy? Um, uh, are we enforcing the uh, the password policy in the right way? So, automation ops helps not only um, not only uh, make this on top of mind, but also enforce this strictly and centrally, right? So enforce standards and security. You can define and enforce co coding standards and best practices across your automation projects. 
to ensure consistency across your developers, reduce errors, and minimize vulnerabilities. You can control the development environment. For the development environment, let's say, you can't have a developer pointing into a production URL or, or, or using a production application, right? So in order to make sure that is enforced, you would be able to define uh, rules within Studio and deploy it in Automation Ops so that um, they would be able to follow it even if um, they didn't read the SOP or the best practice that you have. Of course, improved code quality. Um, Studio comes with or was built on top of Microsoft Foundation Flow or, or so, something like that. And it uses all the other necessary um, analyzer components that is uh, built on top of Microsoft Foundation. Automation deployment, um, centralized management, I mentioned. So these are the top five benefits of using automation ops as part of your, enforcing your governance and policies within your organization. So um, enough with the slides. I, I, I want to go through the and cover what is automation ops by, by, by just showing you. And one of the key components, um, so before I show what's in studio, I'll show you where, where is automation ops, right? So this is uh, only in UiPath Cloud right now and, and, and enabled as default. And in terms of licensing, you don't have to pay for additional um, um, subscription just to have this. So this is already uh, in here that you can leverage, right? So what I'll be covering is this first tab, which is governance, right? And one of the main thing, if you talk about as a developer, let's say in the persona of a developer, on a day-to-day, -day, I use um, Studio. So UiPath Studio, one of the main aspects when it comes to governance and best practices is what we call the workflow analyzer. So it's uh, both a, it's a design time um, code analysis tool that's built for, for this, this uh, IDE, for Studio. And it has already pre-built set of analyzer rules that I mentioned. Some of this came from uh, from the Microsoft Foundation, but um, most of these are customized as per UiPath best practice standards. And you have a naming convention here uh, as, as per the code. And when I say best practice standards, I, I'm talking about this one, right? So workflow design. So studio automation best practices, all of the best practices laid out here, it's not just documented. So what is um, governance doing is it is enforcing it through automation ops and consequently workflow analyzer. And the naming convention here is if it starts with ST, so the first two letters refers to the product code or the product that, that this applies to. ST for studio, right? MA for um, activity level, like, like mail activities. Um, you can see here uh, UX and UI. So these are uh, UI related activities. So UI versus UX. UI is for classic UI automation activities. UX is for modern UI automation activities. So just a distinction between those. You also have rules for testing, TA, and um, yeah, that's it. And all of these are documented, again, in, in the uh, documentation portal. So these are already pre-configured and pre-built. Um, but what I'm showing right now is you can control it, right? I, I mean, uh, uh, let's say you're a developer, right? Right now, I can... I can disable the URL restriction, let's say I can interact with any website because I get this, uh, I already disabled this or I just uh, mark it as an info. So there's no, right now, if this is just being done individually, there's no central like policy enforcement mechanism 
if we just rely on this individual workflow analyzer settings. So I can freely just disable all of this myself and then workflow analyzer, uh, no matter how many rules we have here, this, this, won't, uh, this won't apply, right? So what- yeah, just, uh, for, just for an, one, one simple example, I would like to uh, share here. So let's say um, when you're developing this automation, right, as a, as a developer, and if you're coming from a like a .NET background in Visual Studio, this was implemented as a code analysis rules. Uh, they are provided with Microsoft, and in in essence, if you're using enterprise library, um, I think right now it's six version six and above. Um, that that comes as part of that, and the benefit of it that it actually not just uh, error, but it also looks at design considerations also. Like uh, uh, you cannot declare objects that, uh, that doesn't have any methods defined into it, like class definition. So something on those lines. But here, the beauty of these workflow analyzer uh, tools are, so these are predefined rules where just like Russell mentioned, right? You can always define the, uh, action, whether you want to tag them as error warning, uh, depending on the use case. One simple example could be, let's say your automation, you're you're trying to run a health check bot, health check automation, right? And you're running, uh, validating your internal servers. And those internal servers would not have uh, uh, HTTPS URL. They usually would have HTTP URL because that's not an external facing web uh, web URL. And the policy can be here that if you're using an, a website to test something that it's going to throw this as an error, which is correct, which is correct in general, right? But in your particular case, this is this does not qualify to be as an error. So it can be at best qualified as warning or just as an information, right? So those are areas where this provides you uh, complete control how you define that error and how you want that error to behave because if an error is marked as uh, if if particular policy is marked as an error you cannot publish this automation okay so that's where it builds it provides you that level of control in your development environment itself before you actually publish a particular code um, for production or even for testing. So that's that's the use case where you would enforce these policies uh, in your in your work environment. Uh, please go ahead, Russell. I just wanted to share that that particular Absolutely. example. Yep. And right. And if you want to uh, uh, get more details on what this particular uh, uh, rules are. Right, there's a very convenient hyperlink that's here that you can just click and then see what this uh, what what this uh, policies or rules are and how to configure it. Um, and then, like, let's say for this particular one, URL restrictions and app restrictions. You can set prohibited applications. You can set allowed applications. You can set prohibited URLs, allowed URLs. So you could you can uh, it easily redirects you to the to the documentation page again <clears throat> insecure password use even for the like all these are ui automation related usage of simulate type simulate click which only uh, 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 provides warning right so because not all of the ui elements are compatible with this so there are like uh probably uh 50 plus or probably um, south of um, 100 uh, rules that are already predefined here that you can easily check, right? So this is good, right? You can be able to, um, uh, you can, you could be able to uh, like set the, the workflow analyzer rules so that whichever applies to, that you think applies for your development you can set here, right? But where does automation ops come in here? So automation ops is, 
in a production, in an enterprise scenario, you don't want each and every developer having their own rules, right? In a big development shop, um, implementation shop or, or automation team, you want all of your developers, all of your users have the same policy across and they should not be able to update this, right? So that's where automation ops come in, right? I don't want anyone overriding whatever policy that I I, I set uh, I, as part of our governance. So I want a central, the central center of excellence team to manage these policies for my automation developers. So this is where automation ops come in, right? So in here, you can add a product policy and, and based on the product, there are different settings or policies that you can define. So first, let's start with Studio X, what's available. And then I can name this as Automation Developer Policy, right? Simple. And then it has predefined <coughs> set of tabs right here. <laughs> so these tabs changes depending on the product that you selected. In this case, I selected Studio. So the Studio includes Workflow Analyzer tab, which also shows the Workflow Analyzer rules that I showed earlier. So instead of modifying individual developers being able to modify their own rules, so your COE team can, um, can define this. Uh, centrally and enforce this centrally. I'll show you how this is deployed um, in a bit, but uh, let's just go over to all of these tabs first. So again, this is for Studio and the policy is for automation developers who are using Studio. So first is in, in the design, right? So all of these tabs here, by the way, corresponds to the settings that you have in Studio right here. So you have the design um, and, and other, the team settings. You have the sources. So this um, right here, some of the settings here is what you can control in here, right? So of course, you always want to enforce analyzer before publish, so I set that to yes. I always want to enforce analyzer before run, I set that to yes. Let's say, your analyzer rule includes um, prohibit, uh, prohibited URLs. Um, let's say uipath.com is prohibited, right? So for the for for setting prohibited URL, it's just as simple as uh, a list of URLs, and you can add um, wildcard and in, in the uh, uh, like. These are the supported wildcards like asterisk uipath.com asterisk. Uh, and then it's delimited by, if you want to add another URL, it's delimited by, by semicolon, right? So all of this is in the documentation. So meaning if I, this is enabled and I deploy it for automation developer, when I run the automation and I have an activity or a UI action that interacts with uipath.com, then it won't, even run so it will throw an error based on the action that was uh, specified here so let's say uh, uh, u uh, ux as you see is the code so this one let's say i will specify i will blacklist a url and i'll untick the default value so i can override it so I will say uipath.com and probably I don't want developers automating facebook.com. Um, and yeah, so that's how you specify the URLs. So in black, if you want to blacklist, if you want to whitelist, um, it's either apps. So apps would be the exe, uh, CAB files, 
Um, so you can also put wild cards. So in whitelist, uh, also you can whitelist both apps in your app. So if you have both whitelist and blacklist, then the the whitelisted apps or URLs takes precedence. Meaning if you only blacklisted this, uh, if you blacklisted this, but you also have a whitelist, let's say um, uipath.com, then this one will take precedence, meaning you can still access UiPath, but only UiPath. So that's that's how this um, whitelisting and blacklisting works, and yeah, I just need to save this. Um, and then again, how this works is um, for this setting: if you enforce analyzer before publish, then you cannot publish because if if you're if you're having an automation or a UI interaction with UiPath.com, if it's blacklisted. Uh, because analyzer workflow analyzer runs before publish, and um, if you if you enable this workflow analyzer uh, runs before um, running or debugging your code, right? And this as well, you can enforce analyzer before push check in if you're uh, interacting with if you have a, a Git integration and all other settings here as well. <coughs> And then <laughs> able AI activity suggestions, the use of AI suggestions in a command palette. So this is more of a productivity settings. So you can control the settings here as well, which are which of the productivity features uh, you, the developers should be able to use um, in here, right? So you can also, as part of the design tab, you can also control the default language. So when creating a uh, like an automation, you get to select the 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 language, right? VB or C sharp. So you can set it centrally, manage this centrally, so that let's say if you select VB, uh, if you select uh, the C sharp here then um, this will be the default language for uh, the when creating a new project, right? And some other settings here, I'll just leave it as is for now so that we'll have time for um, the, the other topic later. So general control the settings inside studio settings general. So you can click no so that um, if you click no, you can, they cannot change the settings here. So all, all of this will be uh, 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 disabled feature toggles, send feedback, uh, getting started screen. So these are just the features. Manage sources. Um, this is also related to the feed management. So I'll just um, let uh, Pradeep um, cover this one as well later on the feeds um, topic. I mentioned about workflow analyzer rule, which you can um, uh, directly enforce here or control here. And you can set if the user can override, which doesn't make sense. Uh, if, um, if, if, if you want users to override, then um, uh, yeah. Then um, location will be the location of the yeah. You can these are part of the settings as well as well. And theme would be the the. Uh, the repository for the source control. So, sorry for the background noise there. Um, my son is in the background. But. So, let me just save this. So, once I have completed the creation of the policy, next step is to deploy the, the policy. And you can deploy it either through tenant level, let's say tenant, and then for each of the license in the tenant, you can, uh, these are the license groups, right? Developer, attended, automation developer. You can deploy the policy or you can deploy it per group. This is also uh, uh, referring to the component or product group or license. 
So in this case, I will deploy the policy I created for Studio in the Studio group right here so that whether regardless they are from non-prod or production tenant that you have, all Studio users will be enforced with this policy. So I'll just... Uh, They created. I'll just. So I'll just deploy it. Okay, and then um, I'll just. So the the. You should be connected to the to that particular org or tenant that um, uh, the policy was deployed. And then if I open the studio again, so I tried refreshing the studio through the resource um, section, but it didn't seem to get the policy earlier. So uh hold on so it should be here so this is where you should be able to see if you are having that that policy um deployed uh doesn't seem to reflect right now but let me see so let's see if we can deploy I can save it. Let me just create another one. Then we deploy for the studio group. Here you go. Yep, I have this that one. So I'm deploying to automation developer group, the policy that I created. Let me just reopen. So now you can see here the, the policy that was deployed. Um, since I'm connected to the tenant where the policy was deployed, and I have the automation developer license um, logged in for in your iPad assistant, then this particular policy applies to my profile. And uh, if I open one of my projects, Now you would be able to see here, workflow analyzer settings, that these are not uh, editable, right? So whatever is defined in automation ops, that particular policy will be reflected here and cannot be overridden. Yeah, it's inherited from the, from the group. So group, tenant, it's all tight together the license that you have within a tenant, you can have defined these policies for different groups. Mm -hmm. So you can have a, for attended developer, which is uh, attended automation developers, you can have separate policies for uh, advanced developers, you can have separate policies, you can, sim you can have separate policies for your citizen developers. Yes, absolutely. Uh, 
and for robot level if you're looking at you can you can define those policies for attended and unattended automations as well so that way you can you can control it absolutely and you can see here the design tab you cannot override as well so if you set this to yes in the in that policy then it will be set to yes um, but i just created a new one so i didn't set this to yes so you can just easily edit this edit this from here and then uh, it will reflect once you once the uh, studio has restarted and as pradeep mentioned let's say for assistant we create the uh, automation users assistant so what it has is this uh, feature toggles and widgets but there's also what you call here runtime governance right mm -hmm. so developers are the first like I, if I may, entry point of, because they are the ones that, that are building the project, right? So it makes sense to have um, workflow analyzer as part enforcing workflow analyzer so that they, they don't, they won't be able to include let's say URLs that should not be automated or, or other things in the code. But when it is deployed to the users as part of UI path assistant or robot, there is what we call runtime governance, right? So first, it is disabled as default, but if you enable it, so what it does is it adds additional uh, option. For, oh, this should not be studio. Um, add product policy and assistant. Uh, there should be a run. Oh, it should be. Hold on. It should be robot, I think. Yeah, this is the runtime analyzer. Meaning, even if, let's say, uh, for some reason, the developer doesn't have the the whitelisting URL enforced during the development, right? So, and it, the code was pushed into production. Now the robot is using it, right? So in here, there's this is another line of defense, if I may, where you can also have the list of um, URLs and apps that cannot be accessed by the bot. You can define here or you can block a um, uh, list for, for, for e emails um, sent. So this is what they call the runtime governance, right? And uh, these are just the two default. You could be able to add more custom analyzer rules, whether it's for workflow or runtime analyzer, and then deploy it to your user base as well. So. Yep, I think uh, I had more time that, than uh, anticipated. So let's go to the next topic. Uh, Pradeep, you wanna go uh, cover the next part? Absolutely. Let me start sharing my screen. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Perfect. All right. All right, so Russell has covered already the sections uh, for how do we manage the governance, right? And the governance may seem like, okay, it's a very mundane topic, right? It's, there's not much exciting stuff is going on, but as you expand your team, as you scale automations in your organization, whether it's for COE or it's for uh, it's for your workplace, you would find that it really adds, uh, it solves a lot of problems, day in, day out problem, uh, which, uh, which were not uh, managed without automation ops because managing these policies uh, sharing these policies before automation ops that's how some of us did that we actually shared those governance policies that you saw uh, on the studio 
you could actually download that file and then just share it manually across the team. And that's how we used to manage that uh, on the on, at the workflow analyzer level. The drawback is that, <coughs> excuse me. The drawback is that you cannot do that uh, for your uh, without automation ops. You cannot enforce it beyond studio. So you cannot enforce these policies on the robots, attended, unattended robots. Um, so that's where automation ops really is uh, has a lot of significance from uh, from an IT uh, IT management standpoint, right? So as as a as a delivery manager, as a, as an IT manager, when you're managing these automations at a large scale, uh, then then you realize the benefit of it. So let's move on to the next topic for today. Um, this is about feed management. So this is another concept that EI Path have there in within as part of the automation ops framework itself so what happens all these automations that we build right as as developers you may have already noticed that each of these automations essentially the executable package from these automations is nothing a nuget package okay so once we have these nuget package we can have multiple ways to deploy these code uh, units so you can directly publish them from your studio, or you can actually just take this NuGet package and directly on the orchestrator itself, you can upload it, right? So those are the two ways. Uh, what are the other ways? Uh, we have seen some of it as part of the studio itself. If you go uh, with uh, manage packages uh, tab within your studio uh, application, you can go and find out different packages, different uh, activities, custom activities, uh, even third party activities, whether they are built by Microsoft, OpenAI, whatever it is, right? If you're trying to get some new activities in your code, even the UiPath activities, some of them which are not uh, by default part of the uh, application environment, you go and add those packages. When you're adding those packages, that's nothing but a NuGet package stored at a central location. And you have access to those repository where you can get those libraries and packages and make them part of your own automation, okay? So for that, uh, to mimic that kind of behavior at an organizational level, automation ops provide you the feed, uh, the managing feeds option where you can manage these uh, feeds where all these automations are uploaded. Uh, these packages are, are different types. Either they can be as a library uh, that you can directly take it, or they can be as an automation package itself that you can pick up and start executing them. There could be multiple sources, internal, external, as we talked about. So internal can be within your own organization, uh, and external is a uh, third party, a NuGet repository itself, or even um, uh, some other open source library repositories that you want to be uh, available to your team, okay? So again, the basic uh, premise of having automation ops configuration in your automation life cycle is to enable your team members, provide them a, a a standard consistent working environment okay whether it's through governance policies whether it's through a connecting to a source control as we talked about in session one uh, or setting up pipelines or even for fields management so it provides you gives you a, a, a standard access across for all your team members right across the organization so we'll look at the example. So let's uh, quickly go over some of the context, uh, if you will. So feed types, we talked about the feeds are three different type of feeds. We talked about orchestrator level feeds. Uh, what does that mean? It means the automation that we have already created ourselves. So the team, the team that creates the working on this project or that is within this tenant, all the automations that they have created, that becomes part of the feed, right? And you may think where this may be helpful. So think about um, an organization where you're building automations. And these automations, they are not standalone, right? Some of the components, some of the pieces that you create, they are reusable, OK? And rather than sending code files over email exchanging with your team members, right? it's better to 
put them, publish them as a NuGet package and have them uh, be available as, as part of the feed itself. So what does that provide? That the other developer who wants to leverage the same code, they can import that code using the feed and they can extend it further building on top of uh, what's already available. Uh, the UI path feed that we are already aware of, they can be the official activities or marketplace. And the thing is that the feed, all the feeds that you provide permission to at the automation ops level, those are the only feed uh, repos will be available to all your developers when they're accessing it, whether through a studio, studio X or any or any other UI path IDE for that matter. So some of you may be using Studio Pro, which is uh, no longer active anymore, but it's still out there um, and UI path does support it for uh, for some time. Uh, so that's, that's where those, uh, you can access those repositories using feeds through the IDE. Uh, the last, but uh, I think the last option is the custom feed, which is where you can actually import some open source, third party libraries altogether uh, coming in that you can use it. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Okay, so the benefits part. So uh, I think I briefly touched upon these, why why we need those feeds, uh, because we can, this will be available to across all the team members. You can look at various versions. If you're building these automations in-house that you're making available to your rest of the team, uh, in large organizations where they have multiple automation team, usually what will happen, there will be a core team that does build some common automations, standard automation pieces, and then those automation activities uh, or processes would be available to rest of the team to consume. Um, so they would have an option to keep track of the versions, dependencies, and all that. Uh, through the feed, they can easily manage it. They can easily retire, which is no more supported uh, by them. Um, and custom libraries, we talked about, you can you can manage multiple versions for the same package, and you can use the specific package version for feeds uh, to use it within your tenant. Uh, as a tenant library feed or custom library feed, that I'll, I'll show you uh, shortly. Let me see, there's a question. Is it possible to filter the marketplace feed to allow certain publishers only? Um, to be honest, I have not done that. Uh, at this time, I do not think they have additional filter cap cap capability. Um, that maybe that could be a, a good feature we can request. Uh, as you know, these feeds management and some of the other features of automation ops just became generally available. So we may have, uh, you can definitely suggest it back to the EIBAS product team, or we can go back and talk to them uh, about adding some of those. Uh, there may be a tag option, but I'm not sure. I'll look into that and definitely I'll, I'll, re I'll uh, update you. Uh, Tyler on this, all right? All right, let's go through the demo. Mm, let me move this here. Okay. All right, so we are here at this level at manage feeds level under ui path automation ops as we can access this this is on the ui path cloud and ui path ops is also available at automation suite level but with some limited uh, with constraints i think they are still expanding on it but uh, let's still focus on our topic for today which is manage feeds so we talked about there are three different ways we can add feeds to it or the categories if you will orchestrator, UI path, and custom. So UI orchestrator and UI path, um, you can see here by default, these are the two that we already have available. And this is what helps you in terms of getting your marketplace and official feed. So official feed, what does that mean? All the UI path based components, all the UI path activities that we create. For marketplace, uh, we can go here and see all the marketplace 
objects are here. Uh, back to your question, Tyler, it does not provide any filter. You can only come here and search uh, to make your search process easy, but it does not filter as such uh, at, at top level. So that could be an additional uh, feature request uh, if that, that's really relevant for you. Uh, official is what we know already that it's the standard official package uh, for all the UiPath activities uh, and packages that will be available here. You can use once, and these are actually non-editable as you may have seen, right? Uh, even though I come over here, there is nothing much that I can do besides searching or, or uh, looking at one particular uh, automation activity. Uh, same uh, now, so we looked at the UI path one, which is pretty straightforward. Let's look at the orchestrator one. This, so there are a few things that I would point out here. So, so when we talk about orchestrator, the feeds that will be available to you would be the first by default. If you, whenever you log into your own uh, orchestrator account, uh, so let's say you're logging in case you're not an admin, right? you may not have automation ops access to it, but you can always log into your community edition just to take a look at it, what's available there. You will see one line item here by default, which would be at the tenant level feed. What does that show? And this is your tenant's name. So if you have multiple tenants, you will see each of them listed here. And you can see, you can go back here, you can see, okay, these are the packages that I have built. Uh, just to compare and show, let's take a look at it. So anything that is published within that tenant, all those packages will be available to you at the tenant level feed uh, listing. So what does that primarily mean? Primarily means all the automations that are available under shared folder, okay? So that's where all these use cases that you have here. Now, there are few cases where you may want a separate feed altogether. Just like here, if you see, there's a pipeline feed, which is actually defined at a folder level. So the interesting thing is that you, you don't see here that any option for adding a custom feed for yourself or, well, it's not a custom feed, but let's say, at a different category level, right? So essentially why it's not configurable from here, it's, it's actually configurable from, from when you're creating a folder. So it's a very small, it's a tiny option here. So in, so let's say in pipelines option, if I go here and I click on edit, so you'll see this. Whenever you're creating a new folder, you'll see an option whether you want all the packages here under the tenant package feed, or you want a separate package feed for this folder hierarchy, okay? So this is your choice. You can make this change here and that will reflect. Similarly, if I look at other folders that I have here, they all are actually going back to the tenant package. So anything that I publish under user provisioning or production shared for that matter, they're all going and becoming part of the tenant feed. And this is where your, uh, uh, how you want to set up your organization, right? How you want to set up these automations at an organization level, those decisions will come into picture. Uh, there is no specific guideline in terms of uh, how you want to set it up, but whatever makes sense for your team, uh, if you have a larger team, you may want to do that. Uh, defined, divided by the folder. So you're only looking at those folder level feeds and you're not looking at the whole thing, okay? Uh, last one here is a custom option where you can actually add your own feed. So you can add, uh, you, can, you can connect to a uh, NuGet package itself, or you can connect to open, API, open uh, third party APIs or third party packages, NuGet package, and specifically NuGet packages only because that's what UiPath supports, right? So you can add any other feed, but it won't be beneficial for you if it is not compiled in form of a NuGet package. So that's one thing you need to pay attention to. And that's about it. I mean, feeds is pretty uh, 
small section uh, there is not a lot about it it's managing uh, where the code comes from all those uh, code repositories need to be verified that's why you see most of it primarily is coming from your own orchestrator that's uh, vetted and verified within your organization and ui path which is already the parent the product itself right so it, anything that comes out from ui path uh, feeds those are already vetted by ui path team so with that being said i think we have covered this part as well um, with that we covered our two sections actually four two sessions for our automation ops series uh, next we will be meeting on april 3rd we'll cover uh, the solution management piece of uh, the automation ops if you see here that's the section that is uh, left out so we'll cover in our next session we'll talk about in detail solution management and how you how all these different features governance feed source control pipeline they all come together and you can actually manage your overall solution experience uh, during development packaging and deployment of that okay let me see if there are any other questions do you see any question russ um in the chat i think the the last one was from tyler but i think naresh is raising his hand if is okay. you want to ask yeah uh, yes russell uh, uh in the beginning of the session it's been mentioned like uh, uh we need to connect the bot uh, with an interactive way or the studio and in interactive way rather than using the machine key to enable these features so can can uh, have you covered that part sorry i missed the session one uh, but i will go through if it is part of the session one um i did i, I didn't really cover how to sign in, but I can show it right now, specifically for users of Assistant or Studio. Um, how Let you me do stop it? sharing if you want to share it. Yep. So just quickly showing that real quick. Thanks for that question, uh, Arash. So interactive sign is simply the, the way you consume user licenses whether you are a developer or a uh, uh, just an automation user. So this is what we call interactive sign-in, right? So previously for users, you also do machine key. That's on if the you classic. Change, yeah, if you can change the connection type, then it will show. I think the, the restriction, because if you're using machine key, right? Uh, the system, the automation server orchestrator would not know what kind of user group you are in because you may bring in your individual oh. license that may not be governed through the automation through the orchestrator itself. Yeah, yeah, correct. So that's so, a, that's a, that's a kind of a constraint, right? Then automation ops cannot control the behavior that robot will yeah. reflect. So I think this is a bit con confusing right now because I installed this. Um, this as a unattended robot. So the only option here is machine key and client ID, which is for connecting robot licenses, unattended, non-prod test robot, right? So, um, so this is the type of install that I use for here. So in order to, so, so essentially I can be able to connect to the robot by using the client ID or machine key. So I already connected the robot, right? And um, if this is installed as a uh, uh, attended user, or if you select in the installer, attended user developer, there is an option here to directly sign in, interactive sign in. So the only time it's, it gets available for me is if I already connect it with the robot, because this is primarily installed as a robot. But the interactive sign in that I'm referring to is this one. Um, for me to consume the 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 user um, license that I have configured for myself in the tenant, right? So now this particular assistant is both connected as a developer and a robot, right? Um, That's a standard so, attended automation or a standard yeah. attended automation uh, standard automia. Sorry, attended yeah. robot. 
So, uh, my, my question probably then in that case, actually, we have, as of now, uh, Pradeep and Russell, we have uh, unattended automation. So, uh, mm -hmm. my question uh, is like, so, do we need to uh, change the way that bots, the production bots no. connect to um, connect right now? Because right yeah. now we use the uh, same like a uh, machine key yeah. to connect yes. to like an unattended bot. So, uh, do no, how is the governance enabled? Do we do we need to have no. any? If you define the governance for uh, what if the governance that you define is for robot right here? If you define the like. The, the, if you selected the robot here, mm -hmm. um, okay. any robot that's that's connected, either client, it, yeah, it is at the robot level, right? It's yes. So it's if not... you connect the, yeah. No, so go ahead. Sorry, I was just saying that if it's at a robot level. I I don't think that will sure. that affects how you yeah. how you connect your robot. I think um, you know, for the presentation for the, uh, uh, the the one that you saw earlier, interactive sign in is for um just to clarify is for uh assistant studio x studio studio pro mm -hmm. for the robot policy if you're connected as a robot then the robot policy will apply so in here okay. i'm connected as an attended robot whether it's machine key or client id so the the robot policy that i created here will apply but for the assistant and user licenses right so I have to use interactive signing. Okay, gotcha. Uh, one last question, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, some of our developer licenses have an external license. So it's not part of our uh, automation um, cloud package. So if I wanted to enforce the rules uh, by using the automation ops, isn't it possible for those users, for those uh, automation developers? You, no, it's it's a standalone. Yeah. If it's standalone, yeah. If it's standalone, then as Pradeep mentioned, um, you can copy the policy that you created, and you can just share that with the individual developers so they <coughs> upload it on the studio. This is yeah. Exactly. So you can. Mm -hmm. So when you create, when you connect a studio into uh, and created a policy. You can generate so in that case, your your developers are not connected to that automate to that orchestrator at all, right? So we we can we, they connected to the same orchestrator. Uh, those developers work with us as well on the same orchestrator, but the license is an external license. It's with a particular license code. We enable the uh, automation uh, the the studio license for them, but it's it's it, uh, all those users under the same uh, like um, same cloud same automation cloud so what is yeah. your permission you're assigning to them in the when you're creating those users to connect so um are you creating them as an uh, automation express user yeah uh, no auto, not an automation express user regular users only so they can able to uh, develop the uh, automations in the studio as well as run it it's like just a temporary user, mm -hmm. I can say, because that's why we enable the temporary license rather than the automation cloud. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a familiar setup because in here, you can change to local license. If you're not connected in Orchestrator, uh, you can change local license and then connect it to Orchestrator. So, but that 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 won't be included in the governance because for named user licenses like developer, um, they have to license through the same orchestrator through uh, interactive sign-in. Okay. So. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Probably we'll try it out and I will see how it will. Yeah, you it. can use local policy just like what uh, Russell was talking about. So mm -hmm. you can use that, but uh, let's if if the license is not governed through the orchestrator, right, and there is no way it can enforce governance policy for you, that's okay. not going to work out. You can go the previous route. You, you can export the governance file. It's a config file, um, and then upload it. And I think you can upload it in orchestrator. There's I can ping the link. There's a link that uh, does that. Um, but yeah, we can follow up with that. Can you yeah. reach out to me via or or, or by LinkedIn as well? 
sure, yeah. All right, folks, I think we are over a little over. Uh, thank you for everyone um, staying over. And uh, like we mentioned, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out uh, either to community portal forum or uh, other various social media platforms, whichever you prefer. Um, uh, thank you again. Uh, I hope we see you in our next session as well, uh, where we cover solutions management and we go from there. Thank you, Russ. Well, Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.